All right, the surprising cost, high quality software. So has anybody ever heard this statement ever? Like, we don't have time to write tests. And you can really replace tests with anything. Like, you know, have you done any user testing? Have you done this? Have you done this? And typically the response is, or I hear it a lot, is we would love to do that, but we don't have time. And so kind of the, the underlying implication is that we're pitting speed versus quality. And we're prioritizing speed over quality. And so over the course of this discussion that we're going to have, I would like to really kind of just reframe quality as it pertains to software. And just start to think about, as we start to build software, high quality software, what is the cost of that commitment? So because I'm talking to primarily a management group, I realized that, and some of you may have been previously developers, that you kind of have to frame this a different way because a lot of times when there's this tension that goes unresolved is there's a higher level problem that communication in the culture is not optimized to create an appropriate incentive for where, where that person is. And so this presentation was primarily created to kind of help individuals who really want to commit to high quality software communicate that to the rest of their team upwards and downwards. So typically when you talk to senior leadership, the, the question is like what, what they really care about is can you save me money? And you have to frame your case around that context. Now typically when I talk to managers, the question is can you save me time? And so we have to frame it that way. And then when you talk to developers, it's can you save my job? That typically at the bottom, that's where self-preservation kicks in. And when you communicate this is going to help you actually excel in your career, that helps kind of capture their minds and their hearts. So my fundamental premise is this. Delivering, delivering high quality software, it's a requirement for business. It's not a good idea. It's not just a noble idea. It is an absolute requirement for doing business. So the first question is, if we're going to talk about high quality software, like what is software quality? Well, simply, it's the ability of a system to perform as promised to its customers and stakeholders. I think the better question is, are we delivering high value to our customers? And so first and foremost, when you start to look at high quality software, when you really dial in, why are we creating software in the first place? And oftentimes there's a disconnect there. So I hate to break Mike's heart, like I don't program because I love Ionic, or I don't program because I'm super in love with Angular, or React and I love staying up at you know two in the morning and writing JavaScript or TypeScript. The reason why I program is because it is an opportunity for me to create things that matter to people, that matter to our customers, that we're creating something that actually makes a difference. And when you realize like we're not programming for the sake of programming, we're not managing teams for the sake of managing teams, but ultimately, the end result is that we're creating something that allows the end users to do something meaningful and important in their life. And so, what's the cost of this? What is the cost of high quality software? So, I'm going to show you a slide. And this is from the Economics of Software Quality. And this was by Casper Jones. And there's two kind of main charts here. So, over here, this is the probability of cancellation, of size and quality, and this is the development schedule. So on one side, it's what's the probability of this project being canceled. On the other side is what's the schedule. Now, on the bottom axis, or the x-axis, it has essentially function points. So you just think of this as your application starts to increase in complexity. Everything goes up naturally. So what's interesting about this is that 
over here, wait for it. Well, my clicker's not working, but on the cancellation by size, you'll notice that the low quality software is way off the charts in relation to everything else. What's even more interesting is if you look on the development schedule, high quality software is actually at the bottom with low quality software yet again on the top. So what does this mean? So low quality projects, they're canceled three to four times more frequently than high quality pr projects. So if anybody's ever worked on a project that just never saw the light of the day, that is disheartening. Low quality projects, they have a three to four times more chance of being canceled. So that's costly and demoralizing. Low quality projects, they take longer to develop. So purely on staffing costs, 10 to 20% more. So think about that. If you have, let's say, a $2 million project, and let's go with 10% more, and somebody says, we can't afford to do X. The response is, well, at 10%, can we afford an additional $200,000 to not do this? And so when you start thinking about it in terms of money and project cost, according to this, low quality projects take 10 to 20% longer. So what's the cost of low quality software? Story time. So everybody, let's just get around the fireplace. Let's get our cocoa. Let's talk about this. Low quality software, what is, what is this cost? Like, what's, what's the cost of it? Well, your budget is exceeded. Has anybody heard of healthcare.gov? A fantastic shining example that 1.5 billion to make it operational, and yet when it launched, only 1% of its applicants could even use the system in the first week of operation. Your release date is missed. So Windows Vista, it was going to be a minor release between XP and a true follow-up. Three years later, it finally shows up. I mean, that's significant. Your project is canceled. So Brian, I apologize. I know this is, I'm not trying to get on your case, but Cover Oregon, Healthcare Exchange, $200 million was put into that project. It never saw the light of day. And then there's some intangible things, but important nonetheless. Your brand is damaged. So 2014, Apple released an iOS 8 update. A few hours later, they had to roll it back. That's damaging. General Motors, 4.3 million cars recalled. This one kind of cracks me up. Um, Provident Financial, they had a bug in the code and essentially it just started auto trading. Um, $158 million later, they got it under control. As you can imagine, not good. Or actually it was this one. So this is a fun one. Your security is breached. So Equifax, we know about that. And when you start to look at these in retrospect, typically they're very simple problems that could have been avoided. But they were not. They were undetected. And they exploded in a really big way. So the fifth edition of the software fail watch, 606 recorded software fails. So impacting half the world's population, so 3.7, so half of the people in the world were affected by this. 1.7 trillion in assets and 314 companies. Now think about that for a second. Do we have more than 314 companies in the world? Well, obviously we do. So this is what we just know about. These numbers are astronomical. Not only what, what really I think catches my attention, you have 1.7 trillion in assets, which is a stunning number. More importantly, you have 3.7 billion people that are affected. That, that kind of that ripple effect that affects people on a personal level is huge. So 
your organization cannot afford to not make high quality software a cornerstone of growth. So, okay, now what? What do we do? Like, we talked about some pretty dire circumstances. What are some high quality software strategies that we can implement? So, first and foremost, who's responsible? Well, the answer is everybody. So, individual contributors, they're responsible for their work. More importantly, they're equally responsible for each other's work, their commitments to each other, and the customers. Managers, they're responsible for the health and the team of the organization. So as managers, we need to empower and enable individuals to contribute in a healthy, sustainable way. Now the team, we're responsible for the product and the health of the team, and then the product owner, the same thing, product and the health of the organization. Whatever you are building should benefit the organization in a meaningful way. So this starts with a mindset. So we have to take responsibility that we are committed to delivering high quality software. This is really important. We have to demand a quality when it comes to high quality software. So what I've seen is they will be everybody in a room and there'll be a dominant personality and they'll say, this is the way it's gonna be. Or a strong opinion and maybe a more passive team member who has just a more a equally valid idea, if not more, will kind of capitulate. And just say, okay, this is what we're gonna do. Even though they had a different or a helpful opinion, what happens is you get dominant personalities that essentially assume an unequal place in the decision-making process. And so as individual contributors, managers, is that we have to come and say, look, as craftsmen, as contributors, as someone who's equally vested in this project, we demand an equal voice. And I think as team members, that we demand equal voices for everyone on our team. This is absolutely critical, is that if you realize or you have a propensity to talk a lot, that I can say this you know, this person may not be comfortable just dump, jumping in and asserting themselves, but let's make, it, let's make an opportunity for them to do that. So you demand equality, equal voices in the process, and then you do your best to communicate with bounded accuracy and precision. And be honest, like only say it's done when it's done, which is hilarious because is it done? Is it done done? Or done done done? Is it done with a capital D? Like, so, it's, you know, that's kind of, you know, the funny thing, but really be honest where you are in the process. Is it, is it truly done? So let's talk about defect detection methods. And so we're going to start to kind of look at, at the process of how we approach this. And so this is from Code Complete. And you'll notice we have a litany of methods here. Informal design review, formal design inspection, on and on and on. And what you'll find is that there are things that you can do right at the onset of the software development lifecycle that has a huge probability of catching bugs. So informal de design review, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Informal code review, modeling, prototyping, unit testing. And so you'll notice that these have a place in the software development life cycle. So design review, prototyping, that's very much at the beginning. Implementation, testing, operations. Now the thing to understand is that the longer a bug goes undetected, the cost of fixing it exponentially increases. So for instance, if you catch a bug as you're writing it, the cost to fix that is very, very small. If you catch a bug, in production, the cost to fix that is very, very high. And so the idea is to capture as many bugs as possible at the front of the software development lifecycle. Now the upside of this is that these are actually very low effort activities. It doesn't take very much effort to say, this is my design, what do you think? And just communicate, have a conversation. 
it doesn't take very much effort to have a style guide and say, before you check your code in, go ahead and check this and make sure that it lines up, that it is compliant with our established guidelines for the team. Not only that, with build tools, you can actually run linters and different things. You can actually even automate a lot of that. But the idea is when you're committed to quality and you realize that we're not having to move mountains to do this, we can do some very simple things at the beginning of the software development lifecycle to catch a lot of bugs right on the onset. So inspection, this is a very kind of a human-centric thing, is great at finding defects in the short term. So really prioritize this as part of your development process. Before you do something, talk about it. As you're doing it, inspect it. But then automated testing is great at keeping defects out in the long term. And so now we're moving into kind of a software-centric approach. So here's some quality methods I recommend. Design review, desk checking, code review. Again, these are pretty low effort activities. Monitoring, unit test, you've got functional, static analysis, low test, and a lot of these, once they're set up, are actually pretty low effort. What I do want to say, there's no several bullet. What I recommend, pick five plus unit test. So what this could look like is, okay, we're going to do design review, unit test, desk checking, very low effort things, then we'll do a new function test, code review, integration test, static analysis you can get for free, monitoring, and a system test. And so you really want to front load this at the beginning of the cycle and from there automate everything towards the end. Cool. But the question is, how do I get my team on board? So I would imagine if these are not in place or maybe just a few pieces, is how do you get your team on board to do this? So there's a concept of problem versus tension. And there's problems that are definitively solved. And there's things that look like problems, but it's actually a relationship that you have to manage that's full of tension. So how many of us have ever taken out the trash? Problem solved, right? Did you ever have to take out trash again? Yeah. like. That is not a problem. It's a problematic relationship full of tension that you have to manage. And when you realize that maintaining or creating a healthy environment for teams to do this, it's not a, just a problem that you solve, but it's really a relationship full of healthy tension that you have to manage. So a developer's ideal world is, oh, I live in a vacuum. I just create cool stuff and whatever. But this is the real world. You have stakeholders, developers, quality assurance. And then this is pretty typical. A stakeholder says, I didn't tell you that's what I want. I thought it was obvious. And so this has happened to me a few times. But then you got QA saying, oh, I'll let you know if it works in three days. So you have a breakdown on that end. And so what we need to do is we need to create ownership by allowing for optimization at all levels in this hierarchy. So what we do not control, we leave up to chance. And so if developers are not empowered to control and optimize this, they're going to run into problems. Also, what we do not know leaves us up to chance. And so let's look at this topology real quick. Stakeholders, developers, quality assurance. What happens is conception, construction, and confirmation. So this is a very typical, like we have this idea, build it, confirmation. What really happens is you get a disconnect from here between this is what I want and did you actually do it correctly? And so how we approach this is you will create an environment for developers to optimize upstream through communication, downstream through automation. And when you hit this correctly, what this allows you to do is create high fidelity communication between your stakeholders which then you can capture that and work into your automation, which then will allow you to calibrate the results and feed that back to the stakeholders and give them more meaningful data to work with. And so the last point that I want to make 
before a shepherd's noose comes from the side of the stage and rips me off stage is this is a very typical topology. We have stakeholders, developers, quality assurance, and it's just like an assembly line. Except I propose that as managers, when you empower your developers to essentially be the platform that supports the stakeholders, that supports quality assurance, that they can communicate with precision to the stakeholders, this is what's happening, this is what needs to happen. And then through automated test, unit test, they can enable quality assurance to do automated things better. What happens is this. All of a sudden now, stakeholders and quality assurance, they say, I'm, we're in a good place and you're helping me do my job, which then turns into heart emojis. It's really funny to me how people respond when you help them do their job better and make them look really good doing it. Ironically, they just want you to keep doing that. And so in summary, speed and quality, they are not opposed, diametrically opposed, but they're complementary. And when you start thinking of quality is a complement and enabler to speed by implementing high quality strategies and then implement that as your team. Ultimately what that helps you do is build things faster that matter to your customers, which is I think why we do this anyways. So with that, I'm out of time. Thank you very much. I salute you, Gary. I sure hope I win that trip. All right, here comes the Shepherd Coast.